Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to be in Texas. Now we've got to get this all set up. Now see, I can't. There it is. I see it up there, and I see it here, but I don't have control of it. So I have to be ambidextrous, do with one hand and with the other hand, and I hope that I'll stay on, on track. Though I am vertically challenged, I guess I won't use the step stool to stand up to preach today. <laughs> it's good to be here from uh, Andrews University. I'm just so pleased with these young people and with their memorization of the scriptures. Uh, if you need a good place to summarize the gospel message, it's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 8. And the scripture says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. To hide the scripture in your heart is a wonderful, wonderful blessing. I remember doing that when I was just a young child. Uh, actually, today brings back a number of memories to me. I remember this, I see this young man being baptized this morning. Vance seemed uh, a, a little on the quiet side. And uh, I remember uh, Vance when I was uh, your age, and uh, I was baptized, and uh, I was scared that day. And the uh, pastor, when I came down into the baptistry, he said uh, he wanted to know if I would like to thank someone and if I would like to say it myself. <laughs> I didn't want to talk. <laughs> and I just said, uh, well, who should I thank? Uh, my mother and my father. <laughs> so that's what he said, and that's one of my memories from that very special day many years ago. Today we want to talk about passing the torch to the next generation. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we open your word, we pray that you will speak to our hearts. You'll help us to understand what it means to pass the torch to the next generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's see if this thing works. Well, how about that? I don't know. On my screen, it's all one thing. Can you get over all those, that X that's in the middle of the screen? Yeah, I guess you get used to it. Uh, right, so our thesis for our, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher, you'll, so you'll forgive me. I have a thesis. Um, our thesis today is that the work of Christian education and redemption are one. To restore the image of God in human beings. It is to disciple the next generation to carry the gospel torch to all the world. On our next slide, we see this. Is it working? Yes. You know, recently we had the Olympics, and so you'll see a number of Olympic pictures. Uh, I'm kind of into, into Olympics and, and exercise and that kind of thing. I want to talk to you about discipling, discipling the next generation. I suggest to you that there are four steps in discipling, instruction, relationship, imitation and service and sacrifice. And I wanna go through these four steps with you as we look at our text of scripture together. Our text again is 1 Corinthians 15, verses one to eight. Turn your Bibles there with me, would you please? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses one to eight. This of course is the passage where the apostle Paul describes the gospel message that he gave to the Corinthian people. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And so we see, Paul begins with a reference to a faithful line of transmission. This is where I got the idea of passing the torch. Oh, it didn't move. Well, there we go. I don't know, maybe I should just say next slide. Where am I supposed to point this thing? 
right there. Okay, they show me where I'm supposed to point it. So Paul begins with reference to a faithful line of transmission. He says, I received it and I passed it on to you. It's like a treasure. The gospel message is a treasure, a special treasure that we maintain and that we pass on to the next generation. If the information is not reliable, the instruction is worthless. If I taught you that two plus two was five, and then you went to another school and learned that two plus two is four, all of your math would be messed up, right? If the information is not reliable, the instruction is worthless. So Paul talks about the reliability of the information. Reliable information depends on trustworthy witnesses. Hence, Paul stresses both the number of witnesses and their reliability. Over and over, he tells, he appeared to Cephas, he appeared to the 12, he appeared to more than 500 people at once. I imagine today we have here maybe, what do you think? Not quite 200 people? So take this, pop, take this group and multiply it at least by two. And we have the number of people who saw Jesus all at one time. Now that's an important issue because his resurrection is confirmed by multiple witnesses. Now one person might be deluded. Another person might have a vision or a dream. Jesus appeared to me in a dream or something like that. But 500 people don't have a dream together. 500 people don't have a vision together. They see things that are real and solid like this podium. The resurrection of Jesus is a trustworthy event. All right, we go to our next slide. Did I get it? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Paul ties his instruction to the Old Testament witness. You notice several times he said that he died according to the scriptures. He raised, rose from the dead according to the scriptures. The gospel is not a new innovation. It is the fulfillment of what God promised in the Old Testament. The resurrection of Jesus is the affirmation of all that he taught. It is the foundation of our faith and the driving force of our witness. You see, you have to have instruction. I know sometimes people today, I think, they want to skip by the instruction part and all they want is the relationship part. I'm sorry, that's not the way the gospel works. The gospel contains information. Information that is vital for us to understand. Bible truth that we need to hear, that we need to believe, and we need to practice. Such information is impossible to share in the public school, and rightly so. We live in a pluralistic society, and we do not have the right to impose our beliefs on others in a public setting. It is the private Christian school where we can share this vital information. But somebody may ask, well, Pastor, aren't the home and the church sufficient to do the job? Home, school, and church together actually form a triangle of influence on a child's experience. I made a graphic. Do you like my graphic? <laughs> Took me a little, a little bit to draw the triangle. I see I didn't get it quite in the middle of the page, but actually you'll no notice that there's a if of the triangle against the tug and pull of secular culture around us. Triangles are inherently stable. Remove one side and the stability is lost, decreased or lost. Now you say, wait a minute, are you saying that you have to be in the Christian school to be saved? No, no. It's not impossible for young people in a public setting to be saved and to know their Savior and Lord. But it takes more work. It takes the work of that home and that church working together to help those young people to be safe in Jesus Christ. How much better to have all three working together, the home, the church, and the school. Let's go a little deeper about this. Discipleship is more than instruction. At its heart, it involves relationships. Now this is not deny the importance of instruction. Um, you could say that Instruction, in a sense, is the gasoline in the car, and the relationship is the engine that drives it forward. You need the gasoline for things to move, right? You need that instruction aspect, but it's in a relationship that instruction is learned. 
Let's read another text of scripture to go with a couple texts. Turn over to the Gospel of Mark chapter one. Now you're gonna find that most of the rest of what I'm talking about today comes from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I'm a New Testament professor at the seminary and the Gospel of Mark is my specialty. Uh, I'll tell you about, uh, just give a little commercial here. My students in my classroom like it when I give a commercial. You know why? Because a commercial will not be on the test. That, that's what I tell them. The commercial's not on the test. Oh, let's hear a commercial, Dr. Shepard. You know, let's hear another commercial. Um, I'll give you a little commercial here. The uh, Adventist Church is working on producing a new SDA Bible commentary. It's a very exciting project. The first volume is already out. Maybe you've already seen it in the Adventist Book Center, the one on Genesis. And um, on, uh, quite a number of us, there's about 40 different scholars, Adventist scholars from around the world who are producing these books. I'm writing on the Gospel of Mark and uh, the first part of the book of First Peter. We've had a group of, uh, of our, our team, in fact, we just met in Loma Linda just recently, uh, our editorial board. We've been working on this project now for eight years. And our goal is to have, uh, our goal is to have the commentary published by the General Conference in 2020. Um, we'll see how that goes. But we're, you know, we're really driving forward to get that all completed and everything. But at least there'll be some of the books out. I don't know if they'll all be out. That will be a wonderful blessing of God if they all come out. So I'm kind of acquainted with the Gospel of Mark. You'll forgive me. Let's turn to Mark chapter 1. And we want to read about the story of the first disciples of Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to, me, to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now, these disciples start going with Jesus, and there's more that are added as they go. Turn over to Mark now, Mark chapter 3, because there's kind of a progression that goes on in their discipleship in the Gospel of Mark. And we're char Mark chapter 3 now, verse 13. Mark 3, verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. All right, so notice, there is a link here to Jesus. There's the call, there's the cost, there's the relationship with Jesus, and there's the mission. The first of these two lead to the third one, and the third one leads to the last one, to the mission. So let's kind of walk through this a little bit and see what is involved. The call. The disciples were living ordinary lives. They were fishermen. They weren't highly educated men. Living ordinary lives there by the Sea of Galilee. Jesus invited them to follow him and their lives were never the same. Many in our day, living daily mundane lives will be changed by the call of Jesus. And I hope and pray that as each and every one of our young people in our schools. Look at these words taken from the book, Desire of Ages, page 250. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. They were men of native ability and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there are there is many a man patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers, which if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his co-laborers, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. If you read that wonderful little book that Ellen White wrote called Education. Education, you find down there, she, she talks about uh, young people. And she says, do you have burning in your heart some great desire that you almost dare not say? Th that maybe you'll stand in the court, the rooms of the land and you'll help to establish laws or you'll do some great work that nobody else has done? Now, you might expect 
that Ellen White would say, shame on you, you shouldn't think like that. That's not what she says. She says, all such desires are fine as long as you keep them under the control of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful, wonderful passage. It's along the lines of what we've read in the book, Desire of Ages. So, you see, the disciples had to give up something. Disciples had to give up something to follow Jesus. They gave up their daily life and support. Following Jesus always has a cost. Following Jesus always has a cost. Let me give you an example here. It's like learning a language. Many people don't realize the emotional price you pay to become fluent in another language in the country where they speak that language and they don't speak yours. Sometimes when you can do it on the sly when you're in your own country, you know, you're really blessed here in, in Texas because you have a lot of people who uh, speak Spanish and it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to become bilingual in your own setting. I uh, went and got a haircut yesterday. Hope you think it looks okay. And uh, the, the lady didn't speak much English. So since I was uh, formerly a missionary in Brazil and I speak Portuguese and I, uh, Spanish and Portuguese are kind of sister languages. I started talking to her in Spanish and we had a nice conversation. I talked to her about learning English and you know how challenging it is, but uh, ways that you can do that. Um, when you go to another country and there's five people on the campus who can have a conversation with you in English, um, I'll tell you that you feel isolated and lonely. You can't talk to anyone. You, you can't even... You can't share your feelings. You can't even ask where the bathroom is, you know, when you first get there. It's terrible. But the price you pay is worth it. The price you pay is worth it. That was my daughter who said amen. <laughs> All right? Because an entire new world opens before you, a new culture, another literature, another group of friends. So it is with the gospel. You pay a price to follow Jesus, but the return is worth the price. The return is worth the price. Now here's words from a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who knew about the price of following Jesus. He wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. If you haven't read that book, you ought to get it. The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He lived during the mid 20th century. He was German. He was in Germany during the war. He was actually put to death because of his faith. Here's what he said, cheap grace. Is the, he was a Lutheran minister. Cheap grace is the preaching of, the, of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. And grace, because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his own son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Now, I hope that whets your appetite to go buy that book. You can get it on no Barnes & Noble or, or, or Amazon or whatever, I'm sure. You can probably even download it for free. Who knows? He's been dead for quite a while. But it's a great, a great message, costly grace. This is the cost of following Jesus. But you see what happens when a person follows Jesus is they have a relationship with him. Jesus intent was that the disciples would be with him long term. Education is much more than instruction. It is friendship. It is mentorship. The student learns who the teacher is. Character is more caught than taught. What happens is they see how the teacher treats the students, how the teacher relates to other people around him. 
And if the teacher is good, the student wants to be like the teacher. Now see, here's the risk. In the public school, there's some very good teachers. Some very good teachers. But they may not all have Jesus Christ in their hearts. And our children can be drawn away to those other mentors, those other leaders. Consequently, the importance of Christian education. Students are mentored by good teachers. Students like to emulate good teachers. They like to become like them. Now, it's not just instruction. It's not just relationship. But it's also imitation. Watching is not enough. Discipleship involves practice and imitation. All right, so we want to continue our story in the Gospel of Mark. We turn over to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to 13. Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to 13. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Here is the practice part of discipleship. So while he was still with them, Jesus sent the disciples out on a mission trip, a short-term mission trip. It was a gospel laboratory where they tried things on their own and came back to tell Jesus. Doubtless they made mistakes. But when they returned to Jesus, they discussed these with him and told him what happened on their trip. Now students can learn things from a book or a lecture, but they really learn it when they try it out for themselves. Um, I've seen this in my classroom. Uh, this semester I'm teaching Gospel of Mark and a class called Textual Criticism, where we study, well actually the name of it is the History and Formation of the New Testament, but I teach them about all the different variations in the Gospel manuscripts. <clears throat> my Gospel of Mark class, I teach them how to analyze stories. Then what happens is I give them an assignment that they have to present in class. They have to give a presentation. And I tell them when they, when they give the presentation that they should dress for success. That they should, men should wear a suit, ladies should wear a nice, you know, they should dress properly. Uh, I'm, I'm always intrigued how many of the young men wear bow ties when they present, when uh, they give a presentation in my classroom. They, they, uh, they just, uh, it's like that thing, like, like I'm telling you about emula emulating your professor, you know, and I'm honored when they, when they do that. Um, so they have to work this out and they have to meet with me and they have to ponder how they're going to present it and everything. And that's where they really learn it. They can kind of memorize it for a test, but when they really do it themselves, that's what, that's what Jesus, Jesus was the greatest educator that ever lived. And he sent the disciples out. He gave them a laboratory experience where they tried it out and saw whether it worked or not. This is what's needed in Christian education. Students have to have instruction, they have to have relationship, but they need to try it out on themselves, on their own. They have to try it out, all right? Just so. In the Christian school, young people must be given the opportunity to try out their faith. Not simply learning the truths, but putting them into practice. Where can this be done? Well, that's the fourth step, service and sacrifice. Young Christians need opportunities to share their faith, to serve others, and to make sacrifices. They must be asked, they must be led, they must be given opportunity to do these things. Let's see what happened to the disciples. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. Now see the Gospel of Mark continues on this march of discipleship, there's a, a certain section of the book that's especially focused, if you're interested, especially focused on the question of, of discipleship and Jesus training the disciples. That's Mark chapter 8, 9, and 10. Mark 8, 9, and 10 is the special discipleship section. And we come to this story in 
Mark chapter 10, it actually starts in verse 35 and goes through verse 45. And uh, it's the story of James and John. And they come to Jesus and they say, uh, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Please write us a blank check. <laughs> well, Jesus wasn't that foolish. And he said, what is this you want? And they said, we want to be on your right and on your left when you come in your kingdom. He said, you don't know what you're asking. He said, are you able to be baptized with my baptism? Are you able to drink my cup? And are you able to be baptized with my baptism? They said, we are able. And he said, you will drink my cup and you will be baptized with my baptism, but to sit on my right and my left is not mine to give. Now, when the other disciples heard this, they were angry because they thought that these two disciples had gotten one up on them, see? And uh, so they, they were upset by that. Um, Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Who ended up on his right and his left? It was two thieves when he was put on a cross. <laughs> That's who was on his right and his left. You don't know what you're asking. Can you drink my cup? He drank a cup in Gethsemane. He said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. His baptism was the cross. And there's, there's parallels between that scene and the baptismal scene in Mark chapter one. When my commentary comes out, you can read about that. But now let's read verses 42 to 45 of Mark chapter 10. And Jesus called them to him, all the disciples, and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Young people need opportunities to serve others. Our culture, our culture is about getting. That's all the advertisements is trying to get you to spend money, right? Our culture is about getting. Christian faith is about giving. It's about serving others, not ourselves. Haven't you found it true? That true happiness is not found in receiving, but in giving. It is meeting others' needs that our Christian character is fashioned after the life of Jesus. And you know what? Little children like to serve. They like to serve. You say, help carry the dishes. You give them something that's appropriate for their age. Help bring the, help put this on the table. Now it's time to clean up, you know? And when they do that, what you say is, good job, good job. They like this, they like to, they learn the importance of service when we do this. Jesus actually gave the ultimate sacrifice. His death on the cross has set us free from chasing the mirages and trinkets the world offers. It has set us on a road of service that will find ultimate fulfillment when he comes again. Now, this is a picture that my friend Nathan Green Nathan Green is a member of the church where I go in Eau Claire, Michigan. He's a wonderful man. You probably like his paintings. He's a wonderful guy to know as well. The great day of Jesus' soon return is approaching. I want to meet my Lord with joy, don't you? Christian education is all about preparing our young people for that great day. Passing to them the gospel torch in instruction, in relationships, in imitation, in service, and sacrifice, so that they can carry forward this great work. Now, our teachers at this school, would you, the Cleburne School teachers, would you please stand up? Where are the Cleburne School teachers? Okay, there's Miss Simmons, there's one here. All right, we have, and then when we back up there, there's three teachers, okay. These two ladies and, their, and the people that work with them, you can be seated are helping to mold the characters of our young people. If you do not have your young people in that school, and you're just wondering what it would be like, and how much would it cost, and 
What would it be? How could we arrange that? I'd like to invite you to talk to one of these teachers after the church service. Now, I'm going to make it easier for you. Because when I go out here, I'm going to stand back there at the door and shake hands. Did you do that here, Kleber? Yeah. So, well, that, that, if you didn't do it, I was going to do it anyway. So, uh, um, uh, I'm going to stand back to the, at that door, and I'm going to ask these three teachers to walk out with me. Because do, is that okay? Yeah. All right. That, I was afraid maybe they had to do something with the kids, but I want you to walk out there. I want you to be out there in the foyer, and um, you know. If you're, if you're wondering what it would be like, you know, you may say to yourself, some of you may be saying to yourself, uh, you know, it's impossible for me to send my children to that school. Uh, it just costs too much, and there's, there's no possibility I can do so. Um, do not let money stand in your way. Do not let money stand in your way. Um, if you have a will, there's a way. God can open a door. People, other people can help. You, you, you may be able to help some, maybe some others. They, uh, you have a, a worthy student fund, right? They have a worthy student fund. All right, do not, do not pass up the opportunity. I want to come back to our thesis, okay? Here's our thesis. The work of Christian education and redemption are one, to restore the image of God in human beings. It is to disciple the next generation to carry the gospel torch to all the world. My interest is that this Sabbath not just be, oh, it was nice to hear the kids recite the scripture. It was nice to hear them sing, you know, and all these things. But rather that we get the fire of Christian education in our hearts. Now, you need to realize that quite a few Adventist schools are shrinking in our country. Some of them have been closing. This is not good. It needs to be going the opposite direction. Our schools need to be building. We need to be mission-minded people with a vision for what we can do for the community around us and how we can help train not only our own children but others to know the Lord Jesus and the power of mission. Life is too short to be wasted on self-serving. Christian education is one of those, one of those keystone parts of that triangle that help our young people to be ready for Jesus to come. When our Lord returns, when our Lord returns, there's no greater thing than to see our family there, for our children to be with us. That's what I want. I trust that's what you want too. Let us pray. Lord, today, as we've thought about Christian education, what it means to disciple the next generation, we pray, Father, that you will put in our hearts a burning desire to share the wonderful truth of following Jesus in the young hearts of those around us, our children, so precious. Lord, help us to be that kind of people. If we are those who don't have children in the school, maybe we can help somebody else to have their children in the school. Lord, touch our hearts, guide us to be a blessing to others around us that they also may experience the joy of this Christian education. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.